most of the people here know kind of what we're about and what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve. So I won't go back to the explanation from the beginning. I'll just use this five minutes to give you a status update of where we are now and uh, what is the latest news. And then if anyone has questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. And Eyal will be happy to answer them if you have any questions for him. And then we'll just start uh, jamming. So. DAV is uh, built to be the transportation network of the future. It's a convergence for us, it's a convergence of two major trends that's happening at the same time, blockchain and autonomous vehicles. And that's a big, big opportunity for us to create a platform for this decentralized network, enabling vehicles to transact with one another, to communicate with one another, uh, to enable peer-to-peer -peer collaboration between vehicles and users and charging stations and business owners, and to enable this newly created uh, economy to explode. So our job in doing this is mainly developer-facing tools. That means we need to enable those companies that make the drones and the robots and the cars connect to this network, connect to blockchain, connect to this peer-to-peer -peer marketplace effortlessly. They need to focus on their own core technology and we connect them to our network. So these are just a few examples of the things that we're doing every day. So what we're doing almost uh, daily is interacting with developers. The way for this platform to really explode and to really be exponentially uh, scalable is to involve as many uh, developers as possible, as many industries as possible, and to make it really easy for anyone to connect to, to this network. Um, so what we're doing is focusing on building really, really easy developer tools for companies to integrate with us. Now, this is an, an example of an application that developers um, created using the DAV platform. This happens to be a drone delivery app, and um, it's kind of um, simple. So you basically open the application, you see what's around you, and wh what, what are the drones and vehicles that are around you, and you choose uh, the one that you want to uh, transact with, and they come and they deliver, they pick up your package and they deliver that, and it's all done with the smart contracts, and um, it's trustless, and it's peer-to-peer, -peer, everything that we know from blockchain. Now, you might say, wait, this is kind of futuristic, kind of imaginary, kind of not for today, but then, Tal goes to Moscow and shows us that this is happening today. So one of the first uh, DAV network members is uh, Copter Express. That's a Russian company and they do uh, autonomous delivery drones. So this is, an ad this, this is from Friday, I think, Tal? Was it Friday? This was filmed last Friday. So Copter Express is one of the companies that are now um, adapting the DAV protocol. So that means they're using our tools to um, support the DAV platform to enable anyone to accept DAV using their vehicles. And we have another drone company called Advanced Aircraft Company, and that's uh, the next one in line for integration. And so these are things that we're already building now. Very, very exciting, very, very interesting. And the next in line is Husarian. That's our robotics, autonomous robots platform. So they're also integrating the DAV uh, protocol. And the funny thing is when you start imagining, and not only imagining, but actually implementing the cooperation between those types of vehicles. So for example, these robots are now being programmed to do search and rescue for drones of Copter Express. Right? So what, what happens if you have a delivery, a drone delivery mission and a drone goes missing? Why not, if we have another network member called Usarian and they have these cool autonomous robots that can scout an area that you give them, that means the robots can play a part, another part in the ecosystem and search for a drone. And if they find that, then they report their location and they get the, their uh, payments. And um, so this is really, uh, another way to exponentially grow the whole thing, to create collaborations between the vehicles and the charging stations and the users. This is another, it's kind of um, still in, in game phase, in hacking phase, but we're working with the California University of Maritime Sciences to 
um, implement the dev protocol on an autonomous boat. So we're actually working with them, we're actually implementing the protocol with them, and that means, oh, did I cut off? And that means that um, one of the um, future uh, entrance to the DAV network will be boats, and that can be used for both deliveries and for manned uh, transportation. Okay, so this is kind of a status update on where we are uh, with the team, where we are with um, uh, collaborations, with companies, with um, uh, the different um, technologies and types of vehicles that we're working on. I promised to make it short, did I? Was it short? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions so far before we move on to the sh super crazy jam that we're planning here? You, you want the mic? No, if anybody asks, uh, okay. so I can uh, pass. <laughs> questions? Not that I'm, I'm starting to play. I'm, I'm going to the piano right now. <laughs> Loch, okay, wait no, a minute. Maybe there's a good question from the crowd. Hi, I'm Shimon. I uh, just wanted to hear what do you think, what would be the, um, the market potential for autonomous vehicles? Like, what are we talking about? How big is it going to be in next yeah. years? Thank you, Shimon. Great, great question. So market potential, let's think about that for a second. Now, on one hand, you're kind of tempted to think, wait, wait, wait. What is the market size of autonomous vehicles? And you would think, yeah, not, not much now. So we're seeing drone deliveries in Iceland, that's happening, that's a few dozen millions. And we're seeing uh, drone deliveries in Africa, that's a few more dozen millions. And we're seeing autonomous shuttles in Switzerland. That's a market cap of no more than $100 million, max, max, max. But the plan for DAV is to do decentralized transportation regardless of autonomous vehicles. So the same platform and the same software and the same resources, everything we're creating can be used for manned transportation which is decentralized. The most obvious example would be a decentralized Uber, right? So uh, anyone can be a driver, anyone can order rides and this type of ecosystem that's free from having Uber as a middleman and free from the 20 something percent fees that Uber charges and suffocating the drivers. So there is a lot to be done here and a lot of um, impact that the token and the platform can have even before autom autonomous vehicles come to mainstream. But if you're talking about industry usage and market cap for autonomous vehicles, I have no doubt that over the coming years, it will basically be the entire market cap of transportation, which will, you don't need to calculate that, that's huge. I, I see a Yal next to me, I, I feel like he has, he has something to say. Yeah, just, uh, just a recent thought about, about market cap, which is uh, everyone is looking at the coin market cap today. You know it's uh, the website, uh, the 240 most popular website in the world right now, coin market cap, with uh, 300 million uh, visitors uh, every month so is getting big but the idea is that people are talking about valuation but in fact the valuation we see on coin market cap has nothing to do with companies valuation as we know them today it's like asking how many US dollars are in circulation and what does that number represent this is not stocks of co some company that have some profit sharing mechanism like we used to this is a different financial instrument, it's a different asset class. And the size of, of the market cap of those currencies is basically a size of online economies that are created and we never saw anything like that. So we have no tools to evaluate whether that's too much or too little. Eventually the value, the market cap of each economy is driven by two factors. One is the economic activity and two is the belief of people that the economic activity is going to grow or shrink. Like George Soros, he buys a country's currency, he doesn't care about income, he cares about that economy growing. And if that economy growing, he's going to make money. So those two drivers today mostly, the belief of the people, less the economic activity, but that doesn't matter any, anything. Because even if it's 90% just belief of people that the economy grow, and only 10% of the market cap is the actual economy, but that 10% is growing, those 90% are gonna make money. So it's a new asset class and it should be considered on different terms and not try to apply the old world finance to something that we never saw before. That's what I wanna say. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I, I, I have the feeling that I, I want to make a, that's the awesome points. I, I want to make this disclaimer that we're not financial advisors. <laughs> and, 
any other questions? Yeah. One question, please. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, is is there, name? My name is Ofra. Thank you. Is there any other players in the market to provide uh, this kind of service? So, you, like competitors for, like for competitors, the, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, no, we're not seeing any uh, decentralized transportation networks uh, yet, even though uh, that would be very interesting to, to see and, and would be very interesting to see what kind of added value they can bring on top of that, if we would see that. What we are seeing are some vehicle companies tokenizing their own products, right? So that might be a, a different kind of token, maybe more of an um, asset token or a equity token for their own company, for their own offering. And that's, I think that's a good thing, basically, because we can work with them and, and, and uh, we can collaborate with them and we can kind of decide on what, what are the uses for their token and what are the uses for the network token. But when, when people use their tokens, it can only be used for their company, for their tokens. And we're talking about more of a broad use case for an entire network and for everyone. And they don't have astronauts. They don't have any astronauts, <laughs> yeah. Please. Well, hi, hello, I'm Roger. Hi, Roger. Uh, so I was talking to Tal and he was telling me that you guys are sort of a nonprofit, right, with, with some kind of objective of making as developer-friendly tools as you can so that ultimately um, people will use those tools and then your token will go up in value, right? How is it like running a company in this liminal space, right? It's kind of tricky. You guys are doing open source stuff too um, and are sort of quasi nonprofit. How does that work? I think that's fascinating. It's like a new breed of company really. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. That's that's another great great question. Um, it's, it's, it's a completely new thing. This entire model, the, the, the business model, the economic, the token model is something that we never had in our, at our disposal ever before. And that's one of the things that enabled to build this kind of thing uh, that was never possible before to build something that's non-profit but still can have a huge economic impact. Uh, so um, regarding your question, uh, I find that it's um, fairly um, challenging because uh, every, everything is changing all the time. The legal atmosphere and the uh, kind of uh, the, the, the pace that thing things are progressing and changing is, is, is really, really um, fast. Uh, but on the other hand, we're getting so much excitement and everyone's crazy about crypto now and uh, the people who are crazy about dev are even more excited because it's... it's uh, to them, it's even more exciting than your typical uh, blockchain project. So we're getting so much um, tailwind that f I find that it's really, uh, I, f I get a lot of support and um, um, it helps us fight those ever-changing conditions really successfully. Uh, my name is Max. I work for Lul Ventures, local VC in Israel. Um, you know, one of the challenges I think is developer incentives and aligning them for the long run. It's been talked about by Vitalik and some other people in this space. You know, since a lot of the financial utility is being extracted at the beginning of the project, you know, how do you how do you align sort of the long term vision of the company with the long term development trajectory if you know down the road developers don't have the upside that they have at the beginning? Won't they just leave your project and go to another project? Yeah. Uh, good question. I, I don't think that the incentives for our developers, even today, are economic. Um, even today, we have more developers who are ev not even paid on this project than paid ones. And for the long run, I definitely see the incentives for uh, participating in the project as, one, being involved in a big infrastructure project and having your name on our GitHub, uh, which I think will mean something. And second is adapting the platform and extending it to your business use case. So that's a business motive uh, for other companies and their developers uh, to expand our platform to their needs, uh, which is a, it, it, it is an economic incentive, but not one that uh, we need to worry about and we need to finance. So I think uh, these will be the drivers for keeping that uh, platform uh, running and scalable and ex ever expanding. Hi. Hi. How do you see the, um, the dependency of the long-term success of the DAV protocol 
on the long-term success and scalability of the Ethereum network? That's another great question. Awesome questions, everyone, today. Um, so we, we had to choose a blockchain when we started, right? Now, uh, we chose Ethereum for a few reasons. One, it, obviously, it's the most popular platform. It has the most uh, popular tools and the biggest community around it. But second, it's, it's kind of our DNA. Uh, we have people from Ethereum on our team, uh, and, and it's part of who we are. So we, we get the best resources. We get the best know-how of how to use Ethereum and not just uh, um, be, be a newcomer on a different platform. So this is why we chose Ethereum. But uh, logically, we are a layer above Ethereum. Ethereum is here, to, is here to give us transactions that are safe, that are scalable, that are relatively cheap, that are fast. If Ethereum cannot provide us with that, and I think they will be able to provide us with that, but uh, if after a while we decide that it's not, then we are definitely able to migrate to a different blockchain that does give us that, and it will have zero impact on what we do and the token value for DAV itself. Please. Hey, my name is Rafael. Um, I see a great, a lot of platforms that uh, are some of open source platforms, sort of uh, like Linux or ROS. And uh, I, basically I didn't understand why do you have to be decentralized non-profit organization instead of just being non-profit organization. What is the added value of being decentralized in these autonomous vehicles? So, <clears throat> I think uh, when you're thinking about something like a, trans a transportation network, uh, we're not a decentralized um, organization. We are a non-profit organization. That's one thing. The network is decentralized. And why is it decentralized? Because what's, what's the alternative? The alternative is having a middleman and having a company in the middle and having a center. That means that that company has the interest to extract the most from the network and to give the, list, the least. That's just basic economics. So having a network that is decentralized is, especially in such an infrastructure network, is the only way to go about it. It just makes sense because then the players, the ones who bring the most value, get to share the most value, right? So having a decentralized network is also more scalable. And I, I often give the example of the internet, right? What if the internet was centralized? So you'd have a company, and, and we had that before, like Prodigy, like AOL, like CompuServe. You would go on their internet, and you would serve the internet and pay like 60 uh, shekels a month, and, and that would be your subscription to the internet. And they would serve you the websites that they think you should be seeing. But when we, ad we all adapted this open protocol for how information is transferred and received and acknowledged, then every suddenly every company on earth could develop their own products for the internet, their own website, their own service. And that created a huge explosion. And that made the internet what it is today. So we want to do that for transportation. And that's why it has to be decentralized. Any other questions? OK, I it's think nice it's time to play. Jam. We can jam. There's, there's delicious desserts okay. coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much.